Welcome to Inc.'s The Founders Project with Alexa Von Tobel. I'm Alexa, the founder of LearnVest, author of New York Times bestselling book, Financially Fearless, and second book, Financially Forward. I'm also the founder and managing partner of Inspired Capital, a venture firm focused on the entrepreneurs of the future. Each week, we sit down with the top founder to share their story of guts, inspiration, and drive. Hi, everybody. I'm your host, Alex Von Tobel. And this week, I'm excited for you to meet Scott Fakwa, the co-founder and co-CEO of Atlassian, the company on a mission to help unleash the potential of every team. Scott started Atlassian in 2001, along with his university friend, Mike Cannon Brooks. The duo had launched iconic products like Jira and Confluence into the world with over 240,000 customers. They took Atlassian public in 2015, and the company currently has a market cap of over $40 billion. Outside Atlassian, Scott is passionate about making corporate philanthropy an integral part of business, spearheading the Pledge 1% movement. He is a co-founder of Skip Capital, a private investment fund, and on the board of directors of the Tech Council of Australia. Scott has been recognized as a leading entrepreneur by Ernst & Young, Forbes, and many others. And with that, let's welcome Scott. I want to go back to the beginning, just for everyone listening. What's Atlassian in your own words? So we're a collaboration software company. Um, so anyone who works in a team benefits from using our tools. And we make collaboration tools like Jira, Trello, Confluence. But I guess what your listeners might need to know is that we have tools for every team to help knowledge workers collaborate. Can we go back to 2001? How did you and Mike meet? And what was the aha moment where you were like, let's go build a business together? We met in Australia in college and uh, we did a scholarship course. There were, there were only 40 or 50 people who did our specific course and you got to work for a whole bunch of different companies as a result of that scholarship. You might call it a sandwich uh, course over in the US and so we got to work at a whole bunch of relatively uninspiring Australian companies in my undergraduate and when it came to graduating, my co-founder Mike sent around an email to people and just said, hey look, I think we can do something better than going to work for a boring company and having to wear a suit to work every day. I, you know, there were a lot of people on the email chain and I was the only one to really say yes. And the two of us started by building something totally different actually to what we sell today. We built a support company and uh, we supported a bit of software that was written out of uh, Sweden. Most of the customers were in America and uh, it was a terrible business, absolutely terrible. And we're so lucky that it was so terrible because many people get trapped in okay businesses. We were lucky to be trapped in a terrible, terrible business. And <laughs> after about a year or two of waking up at three in the morning, trying to dust myself off and not sound like I'd woken up to answer the phone, uh, we decided to start building our own software and uh, that's how we got going. Can you talk a little bit about those early days? You just said something that I love, which is, you're like, most people are kind of trapped in a, uh, like an okay business. You're tra trapped in the beginning in a terrible business. And then it really started to transition into a real business. Can you talk a little bit about that transition and when you started to feel things clicking? Yeah, I think when we were lucky that when you hit on something that has product market fit, which didn't have a term back then uh, when, we, when we did it, um, but when you hit on something that customers really love, particularly on the internet, it can happen really quickly. And, you know, one of the biggest moments for us was that United Airlines, sorry, American Airlines, uh, facts that came in where um, neither Mike nor I had chatted with them. So they had gone to our website, downloaded our product, evaluated it, tried it, and literally just sent us money via like the telephone system. And uh, that was a real moment. This is sort of before people put credit cards online. From there, we grew really fast. I remember our first year of revenue was three hundred thousand dollars, then one point two million, then uh, four million, then twelve million. Like the numbers grew really, really quickly uh, as a result. And uh, you know, we were, you know, we'd, we'd hit on something that really like mattered to people. To do that, you've got to grow quickly. You've got to fake it till you make it a lot. We used to have on our website we said Alassian has a number of international offices. Um, what we didn't say on our website was that number just happened to be one. We had sales at Alassian.com and support at Alassian.com and service at Alassian.com. And they all just went to Mike and myself. We couldn't afford to go to conferences and sponsor anything. And so we would turn up at a conference that, you know, we'd get an attendee ticket and uh, we would turn up to a session and we would roll in shopping trolley full of beer and we'd stick Alassian logos on the beer and hand them out as people walked into the conference center and, uh, you know, until we got caught and then, uh, you know, but uh, we handed out free beer and everyone was talking about us as a result. In your mind, what makes an Atlassian product? Like, when were you like, all right, this is good enough. This matters. This can be a product that we, we own. I think it comes down to purpose and mission as an organization. Early on, I, our mission evolved multiple times. I think we were 20 something year old when we started and 
one of the early ones I remember was we create useful products people lust after, which looking back now is possibly the worst like mission statement you can have because it doesn't say anything and it's got a word that means totally different things to what we intended it to mean uh, <laughs> in there. And so um, we had, with our first chairperson, um, we sat down and did a whiteboard exercise and we came out that our mission is to unleash the potential of every team, mainly knowledge teams, but it really is how do we get teams to work better together? And we don't do stuff for one person. We don't really do stuff for companies. We do stuff for teams of people. And so Alassian products are largely around helping teams work better. And that can be on a organizing the tasks that need to get done. It could be organizing the information that needs to get shared. It could be helping those teams be more productive by being more human at work. And uh, we run health monitors and health checks that you can run for your team. In fact, listeners of this podcast can go to search for Alassian Health Monitor and uh, Alassian Team Playbook, and you'll end up on the same spot, which has a whole bunch of information around how to make high-performing teams. If you go back to those early days, if you have to describe an adjective or a skill set or something that you guys did that you attribute to why it started working, what would you say that was? Look, I, I mean, luck has to play in a role, right? So you can do a lot of right things and end up end up wrong. There's a couple ways. I think there's... Um, so I think Mike and I are lifelong learners. Um, if you uh, talk to people who interact with us, we're in, insanely curious about the world and how it all works. And I think as a founder, you need to do that because you're always trying to, you know, have to change and adjust. And the business we ran when there was two of us uh, is de- very different from the business we run with 10,000 of us. And so for me, I think insatiable curiosity is probably the big characteristic that helped us. And and Back in the day, that was reading every business book we could get our hands on from, you know, Wu Gershner's Elephants, you know, who says elephants can't dance, like, you know, sort of business classic books like that. Then on a business side of things, there are sort of huge, huge aspects around market timing that make a difference. And we uh, happened on a few things that all happened at once that uh, I think in retrospect seem obvious, but I think we're pretty prescient at the time. Uh, One is that uh, there was the rise of open source software programming. And uh, for those who aren't familiar with that, that is basically shared code that everyone contributes to and everyone benefits from. And what that meant is we could build a product really quickly by leveraging this shared code. Um, Two is we leveraged a different distribution model. So the web was a totally new distribution model out there. And things we might pay $10 or $20 a click to Google for today, we could get for one to two cents a click back then. And uh, I only wish I had a bigger marketing budget to spend. Um, And then lastly... Our product was introduced right at the time when people were moving from desktop server, right? And people used to, you know, download right, products and interact with them. Um, and uh, we, we were cloud native or, or browser native, um, probably more accurately. And so that meant all of our competitors who had built these client server products had to basically restart from scratch. And it was a really level playing field for us to catch up. Part of your self-service model came out of the desire to be a global company, which you truly are. Can you share any lessons about building across borders and self-service? We did something pretty unique, which was selling online globally from Australia day one. And we didn't sell a single copy of our products. I think it was our 11th copy was sold in Australia. So we sold 10 other copies elsewhere in the world before we sold one in our own country. Um, on the internet, as I said, like, no one knew how big Alassian was and uh, we could sell globally from day one. It didn't matter. Uh, and so for us, it was really understanding that we had to sell globally and therefore we couldn't have salespeople because we you know, didn't have offices in those uh, other places. Um, the number of offices was one in Australia. And uh, if we didn't have salespeople, we needed the software to sell itself. And if it's going to sell itself, it's got to sell online. And if it's online, it needs to be able to put on a credit card. So therefore, there's a price amount. If you're going to sell $5,000 worth of software, you need to sell a lot of it. So it needs to appeal to a lot of people. And so our business model really was very reinforcing. And people, you know, you read the business books about strategy should be really self-reinforcing so that no one could copy one aspect of your strategy. And uh, again, I don't think we were that smart when we when we started this, but, uh, you know, our competitor couldn't copy us because they were selling $500,000 copies of software. We were selling $5,000. And you know, they would have had to retool, not sell through sales, people sell online, a whole different, pro- like the product couldn't install itself. So it was totally different to what was out there um, previously. And um, we had a belief that the market for our products was vastly greater than our competitors believed. So I want to transition a little bit more to today. 
AI is obviously impacting every sector. And a few months back, you just announced the partnership with OpenAI. Let's start with the question, which is, how do you believe AI will change and impact Atlassian? So Atlassian helps people collaborate like better. And I think if you think about the things we do, we help people organize their work, we help them to share knowledge, we help them to get help across their organization, we help high performing teams. And uh, if I then think about, okay, well, you know, what happens when we do them those jobs well, people turn up and they are either more productive because they can get more done in a day, or they are just more happy because like they're more human, they enjoy their interactions more, like they're less frustrated trying to find work. And so we make our customers happier and more productive. And so then I think, okay, well, how does AI help achieve those outcomes for those jobs to be done? And if you look at knowledge work, a lot of knowledge work today is still uh, a lot of copy paste, a lot of rote work, a lot of, uh, you know, doing things multiple times, sourcing information everywhere. I don't know a single person, you know, that wakes up in the morning and thinks, ah, oh, everything I've got to do today is just, you know, served up on a silver platter. Like, you know, you often, often have to wade through different to-do lists in different places to work out what the most important thing to do is. And I think large language models and the AI of that's, you know, come out in the last few months has really got a huge opportunity to improve that. And so as an example, uh, inside Confluence, which is our knowledge sharing product, um, I could look at your teams who you interact with uh, well and see what they've been doing over the last week and then look at what you've read already. So don't share with you stuff you've already read. And then I can summarize it for you. So there may be, you know, 10 hours worth of reading, but I could summarize it in 10 minutes. And if you want to see more, you can obviously read more than that, but we can, you know, give you a summary in in that 10 minutes and tell you who to go to for more information. And so this is going to save a whole bunch of time for people and that busy work um, that uh, otherwise would happen. And I think it's going to make our customers more creative uh, and give them more time to do the stuff that's really value add. If we fast forward five years, 10 years, can you make some predictions about how you think about the future of team collaboration platforms. Give us, give us some of your wild ones. What do you see that's coming that feels obvious to you? Waking up in the morning and having your to-do list perfectly arranged for you. Here are the things you need to do. And hopefully they're higher order tasks. They're not like respond to these three emails. It's gonna be, hey, you've got this new um, idea that needs to be like further thought through or how you like, you know, how do you put these two things together in a whole new different way? I think the idea of bootloading stuff, you know, so much of knowledge that you have to learn is not relevant to you at that point in time. And so really being able to give you the knowledge that's really important, um, you know, there. Collaboration between people is such a human thing and we haven't really brought technology to that uh, as much and understanding um, people's mood and tone and, uh, you know, kind of understanding that to make sure that we can collaborate better um, as human beings. And so that may not be just large language models, it may be a lot of other things that we can do around that. But I get excited by how can we make human to human interaction more real? And, um, you know, I'm, I'm a bit of a geek. I, you know, would say that emotions is not my first language. It's a, it's a second language I've had to learn over the years. And I uh, probably didn't learn as a child. So it's a little harder to, like all languages, harder to learn when you grow up. And, uh, I'd like to think if there's, you know, ways to help people like myself learn that new language, like that would be go a long way. Atlassian is really credited for kicking off the Australian tech scene. That's pretty exciting if you think about it. Can we talk a little bit about how important a community is in technology, in entrepreneurship, and maybe a lesson you've learned? I benefited from a, you know, a community globally because there was no community in Australia for us to tap into. And uh, I think people in America forget how global communities can be on the internet because I, uh, when we first took capital, I remember turning up at our venture capital's office, venture capitalist office, talking about the latest news that had happened. I think it was Foursquare, if anyone remembers that from a long time ago, something had happened. Uh, and uh, I was talking about it just as fluently as the people in Silicon Valley. And they're like, how did you find this out? And you're like, TechCrunch is the same in Australia as it is uh, in the US back, you know, back then and Mike Arrington writing it and uh, that was sort of amazed. And and I think we benefited from global communities uh, in the early days and our way of giving back has been to sponsor the Australian community and uh, both from leadership, we try and help out people that we can, um, but there's a big Atlassian diaspora actually that end up being senior leaders in these organisations and 
all the ones I mentioned actually have had Alaskan alumni take on senior leadership positions in those companies. I want to ask one last question before we transition a little bit more to you. You've been really vocal about maintaining flexible remote work policy and really on the forefront of Team Anywhere, that Team Anywhere approach. Can you talk a little bit about what you've learned? Teach us. So early on in the pandemic, about three months in, we made the decision to never go back to our offices. And we made that decision unequivocally. Like we told everyone, we sung it from the rooftops and we wrote it in blood uh, because We knew that the pandemic would take multiple years. We wanted to hire the best people around the world during that period of time. And we wanted to give people certainty that they don't have to, you know, that they can go live in Boulder, Colorado, or they can go live in Florida, and we're not going to ask them to move at some stage in the future. And uh, so I guess our employees have benefited from that, whilst many other companies have, you know, said remote forever, then said maybe back in the office, then employees have revolted, then they said maybe we'll do some weird hybrid thing that seems the worst of all worlds. And so... We're hybrid. We're in the office one to two days a week is the worst of all worlds because what that means is that you can't hire people remotely, but you're also not communicating synchronously in person. You sort of have you communicate, you have to communicate asynchronously, but you're not getting a great talent audience. But I think that's where companies have ended up when they can't make a decision. Let's just go back to what was previously. So maybe it's four days a week now, maybe it's three, but we're all the same three. And that's just going back to what we were doing before the pandemic. And look, we've worked that way for 50 or 60 years. I think it's valid. I think if you're a small startup maybe, and you don't have, uh, you know, many huge talent needs that aren't served by your local geography, that's a totally valid way, to, you know, to run a business. But what we found is that then you can't tap into the global audience. And if you were remote, it's very hard to go back to that. And so, um, but if you're a startup or, you, you know, you're making policies from scratch, I can see that as a totally valid choice. What we found is that allowing our employees to work anywhere that is the right time zone, They have the legal right to work and we have the legal right to employ them. If those three things are are ticked off, you can work anywhere on the planet. And that means that over the last 12 to 24 months, half the people we've hired have lived more than two hours from an Alaskan office. And so you think about that, like one in two people we could not have hired in the last two years if we didn't have this policy. And so like the people we're getting are just totally amazing as a result. We then said, okay, well, we have what we call Team Anywhere, so work from anywhere. And then we deliberately invest in intentional togetherness, which is when you come together, you do it not to get the work done, you do it to build trust, bonds, to build social dynamics a- as part of the team. And so we've reconfigured our offices so that when you know you come in to the office as a team, um, we have you know space uh, to do that. And uh, we expect you to go to dinner, we expect you to do um, philanthropy um, as a team we don't expect you to do work when you get together. Our numbers are like 78% of Alaskans choose or, or you know chose to come into the office last quarter. Um, and so, you know, we still have offices. We haven't shut, uh, I think, any of them down. And uh, so people will come, you know, still come to the office to do these intentional togetherness meetings. And we then say, well, what's the benefit of, of that? How long does it last? And we've actually tracked our connectedness between uh, the employee and the company. Like, obviously, you ask your employee surveys lots of different questions. The one we think that's important is how connected do you feel to the company? Because we think that would atrophy with a team anywhere environment. And we found, actually, when you get together for this intentional togetherness, you get a spike in, uh, effectively, the connected feelings. Um, and these last for four to five months. So we actually tracked that through the surveys and looked at the decay rate. And so it looks like basically three to four times a year is sort of the optimal amount of time to people to get together. It's not every single day. And then if you think about it, well, actually, how often, even if you go to the office three days a week, how often do you sit and build intentional togetherness? For many companies, that's that's never or once a year. Um, and when we've done the surveys and studies, it's the intentional togetherness that makes the difference. It's not sitting next to each other quietly doing work. That, that actually doesn't build anything um, that's worthwhile. I think as a startup, you have two choices. I think if you know the people that you are working with in the startup and already have trust largely built out, you can do that from anywhere. I don't think you need to be in the same office. I think if you're a founding team and you're you know, a half dozen people and you can find all those people in a single city, I think you probably move faster uh, as a result of being that. Um, and the trade-off is, is that there is some downsides to being remote. It's not all like you know, sunshine and, and roses. You have a way better talent pool, but you have to spend more time on, you know, building asynchronous ways of working. You have to invest money in intentional togetherness. And so if we could have all the people work at Atlassian or working in one floor in one building in one city, 
that would be the optimal outcome, but at a practical level, you can't. And, you know, even taking into account commutes, like many people in, I'm in the Bay Area at the moment, their average commute is 45 minutes to an hour each way a day. That's an hour and a half to two hours a day. And I know that now that I'm traveling over here and, and commuting, um, I don't get to do my workout each day in the gym, which I, you know, like doing uh, on a regular basis. Like that two hours just disappears. And so, um, th- there are downsides, there are upsides, uh, but as a startup, you, you could choose uh, one or the other. I think the worst is wavering though. Make a decision and stick with it. Don't be halfway. And we'll be right back after a message from our sponsors. Okay, Scott, I want to transition to you. I want to go back to when you were younger. Was there a moment of practice? Was there something that your parents did in the rearview mirror? Something that happened in childhood that you kind of attribute to being something important that you harness your success from? I think like many people, my drive comes from a desire to prove myself, you know, and prove myself worthy of, um, you know, being a human and being loved and all those types of things. And uh, I can probably trace that back to, you know, a a father who was uh, maybe a bit shorter on his like attention of love and things like that and better than his father. So, you know, you go down the tree and uh, everyone's improving on on what they grew up with. But uh, I'm knowingly, I don't think I would have ever said that and probably took me through my 30s and large amounts of therapy and, and, and working on myself to understand that. But I think there's an aspect of just proving like to someone, yourself and the world that like, hey, you're, you're a valid, worthy person. And the other one for me, I think, is that I had an opportunity to do Boy Scouts um, or in Australia, it's just called Scouts because we have girls as well. I think uh, for me, I, I went to a, a public school. Um, I didn't have any real leg up in life more than anyone else. Um, there was no wealth or my dad worked at a service station, at a gas station. My mum worked at McDonald's. Like, you know, wasn't sort of born with a silver spoon. And I think the scout um, opportunity really gave me a chance to try out a whole bunch of independence leadership. For me, I think the leadership skills that I learned then the opportunity to try that out at a young age, I think, made a big difference. So I guess that's my motivation and some of the early shaping. My favorite fact was that you and your co-founder, who are both co-CEOs, and I'll get there in a second, you basically were like, we can start something and pay ourselves $48,000. Why would we go work for somebody else? And when you say it that way, it's so rational. It's It really is like, why wouldn't you bet on yourself? Like, can you talk through, was that comfort with risk always innate? Tell us more. When we started the business, we were coming out of university and all of our, the graduate salary in Australia was $48,500 a year. And uh, all of our friends went and worked for PricewaterhouseCoopers, uh, earning that amount of money. And we just said, well, what if we could do that and have more fun, not wear a tie to work? And uh, I figured the worst would happen, I'd have to go live at home with my parents. And I'm like, okay, I did that for a long time. I can do that for another year or two. And I figured that job would always be there. I figured that, I, you know, that uh, if every one of my peers in my university course can get that job, then I can probably get that in two years as well. And that in the two years, I'll learn a lot about myself, about running a business, about life uh, in doing so. And uh, I take my hats off to people that start their business in their 30s and 40s when they have mortgages and families and, uh, you know, s- people have to support like that, I think is a really difficult thing to do. And when we started, Mike had some savings. And so he, you know, could live off his savings while we, we started the business. I had to go work part time at the university doing tutorials and things like that on nights and weekends to, you know, to be able to pay the rent. And um, anyway, I think just the downside risk of doing that was very, very low. And uh, I, I really didn't think I, the opportunity cost was there at all. Also, these days, look, there's lots more startups you could go start at as well. And like you might say, actually, I get way better experience going, you know, two years at a startup before I start a company because I can pick up a lot more experience. But back in then in Australia, there was no option for that. And so it was really big company or start our own thing. You and Mike really quickly have such a special partnership. It's pretty incredible. Co-founders, co-CEOs. You took the company public in 2015 as co-CEOs. Talk just really quickly what makes a fabulous partnership. Mike and I have had the same 20-year journey in Alassian, so the exact same data points. We did the same university course, so we had the same data points there. We approach life in very different ways, and we're very different personality types, very different ways of thinking. And that's worked out really well for us because we have utmost respect for each other um, and what we bring, but we have the same data sets to be able to you know, roll in and wrangle and uh, 
inspect and draw upon. And uh, we're at the same life stages. He's born exactly one month before me. Uh, we both got married within three to six months of each other. We had our first kid within three to six months of each other. And so we're at similar stages of life and want the same thing out of work. And that's been incredible. So aligned value system, aligned life stage, aligned vision for the future, and then the things we differ are on the way we approach problems. And so that's been been a lot of fun, um, you know, been ups and downs like every relationship, uh, you know, in terms of sometimes you, you love working with that person, sometimes you're like, ah, you just frustrate me. <laughs> but at the end of the day, we wouldn't have achieved what we have together individually. Um, and that goes a long way. Give us your secret. What have you learned about managing stress? There's an aspect I read a book, was reading last night because I couldn't sleep about conscious leadership and 15 principles or something like that. And um, the idea is how you show up. Do you show up where you have to be right? You know, you've got an uncertainty there, fear-based, or do you show up like wanting to learn and wanting to be magnanimous? Do you want to like kind of build people up and bring joy and energy to them? And to do that, you, you need to be in a good headspace. You need to be in a good physical space. You need to take care of yourself. So I prioritize um, exercise almost every single day. I do triathlons is my particular poison, but, uh, you know, I try and do something on that every every single day. And then I try and get sleep that matters and I try and, you know, bring do stuff that brings me joy. And I think that's made a big difference to even say, no, I can't help you with that. It's just not a, pair, a part that brings me joy is better than doing it and being resentful uh, of how you spend your time. So I think that that mental outlook, I think, has, has served me well, but it's a relatively recent thing. Scott, I could talk to you for hours. Um, I have so many other places I want to go. I want to go to the quick fire round where I'm just going to ask you a question. I just want the first things that come to your head as quickly as possible. The first is what gets you out of bed every day? You see my kids get me out of bed every day when I not, not, not that long ago. But for me, getting out of bed uh, at the moment is exercise. So honestly, that gets me physically out of bed every morning is to get the exercise in. Um, what is a favorite interview question? If you had to give a TED talk that was nothing about your work, what would you give a 20-minute TED Talk on? Is there a book that's really impacted you? Uh, there's a book called Who, um, you know, also, you know, which is about basically how to hire great people. And that's the number one thing that makes or breaks a, a company um, is, you know, the people that are in it. And uh, it's a very prescriptive way of hiring that I have hired every single person with and I use uh, that mechanism every single week. Is there a quote you live by? There's two. There's a man's reach should exceed his grasp or what's a heaven for, um, which I studied in high school, which is I think is basically you've got to always be reaching and dreaming beyond what is possible, like, and you've got to fail and, you know, you've always got to be kind of aspiring out there. And then there's a quote about the unreasonable man, which is basically, I'm going to butcher it, but basically, you know, all progress comes from the unreasonable man because, you know, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world as it is and uh, the unreasonable man makes the world adapt to, to them, and therefore all progress comes from the unreasonable man. Biggest pinch me moment to date? Probably one that stands out is we went public in 2015. In the afternoon, I, I cleared an hour of our schedule between US media and Australian media that was coming online a few hours later. And Mike and I got to walk up through Times Square and you sort of emerge out of this building you've been in since the early hours of the morning. And we went to raise pizza. I just remember sitting there with Mike and we both got our single slice of pizza and, and sitting there looking at each other and we've just emerged from this maelstrom of like excitement, energy, adrenaline and everything. And it's almost like sitting there looking around like no one knows what just happened to us. It's, it's almost like, I don't know, it's like winning an award or something and they're just walking out and be like, all right, guess this is just life. It, life didn't change for everyone. And, uh, and you know, our net worth had increased dramatically like over that morning and the adrenaline and you're like, ah, guess we can still eat here and eat dollar fifty pizza by the slice and uh, no one else cares about it. So uh, yeah, that was, a, that was a big point at the moment. My last question, it's a simple one. Is there one thing you hold as sacred, kind of like a pillar inside? I think integrity for me is that. Do what you say you, you're going to do, but like act as though the whole world's watching every time you do something. There's, there's some uh, better people that can make and distill that down, but it's for me, it's a deep sense of integrity. Scott, first of all, what an absolute joy. What a fun human you are on so many levels. And I feel like there's at least three or four pearls of wisdom that came out of here that I'm going to hang on to and potentially even write about. There's some really good nuggets in there. Everybody, if you have not already checked out Atlassian, please head to Atlassian.com. All businesses should be using it. And you can join us next week for Inc. The Founders Project with Alexa Von Tobel. Scott, we're rooting for you. I can't believe we're literally a year apart 
a block away um, building businesses and just what you've accomplished is not only like profound, but just what you're paying for to everybody is incredible. Thank you so, so much. Thank you for hosting me. I really appreciate it. This is so much fun. Let's do it again sometime.